Hello, welcome everyone. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. More and more people are joining uh, with every minute. We're very excited. Um, so yeah, we will just get started and thank you for sharing where you're from. Um, it's wonderful to hear. So hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, we are ASCUS Art and Science. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we are committed to bridging the gap between the arts and the sciences, and we work with partners and practitioners to create innovative projects, to engage new and wider audiences, and facilitate innovative hands-on public engagement with both fields. And we are based in Summer Hall in Edinburgh, UK. And yeah, Askers Lab is proud to say that we are the UK largest uh, publicly accessible lab for a multidisciplinary space to produce and create and research and experiment and play. And today we are excited to share with you our latest collaborative project, Molecular Architectures, which was envisioned and is led by Dr. Amanda Jarvis from the School of Chemistry of the University of Edinburgh. And um, yeah, let me just briefly introduce our project. Um, so again, thank you. I can see more and more joining. This is really fantastic. So Molecular Architectures Towards Cross-Disciplinary Design and Chemistry is a program of design science interactive creative exchange events like today that aim to provide time and space for chemists and artists and designers to share the approaches and concepts and language used during the design process and to learn from other disciplines. And we are led by four main questions. Um, first, what does design mean in the context of chemistry? How does creativity connect design and science? And what are the similarities between science and design language, methods and processes? And how can these disciplines learn from each other? And how might sharing design approaches across artists, designers and scientists lead to new possibilities for molecular design? So these are questions that Dr. Amanda Jarvis um, from the School of Chemistry at the University of Edinburgh has been asking and that led her towards uh, launching this project together with ASCUS. And this is due to, as in her field, design methods are inherent, an inherent part of scientific research as a chemist developing transition metal catalysts. And today we will join her for a discussion round that meets with selected art science design duos to dive into cross-disciplinary design and chemistry collaborations. And in the next one and a half hours or so, we will explore their creative outputs and gain more insights on their collaborative journey to guide what has already been achieved and what conversations still need to be had to help us to be the best designers uh, we can be in all disciplines. Um, we are delighted to have Emily Candela as panel chair today, a researcher focusing on relationships between design and science. She's also a sound practitioner, curator and senior tutor in communication design at the Royal College of Art. We also have the fantastic creative duo, John Hardy and Adam Blaney from Lancaster University on board who will share of their collaborative endeavors into the potential of chemistry in multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary teaching. Um, they will also be joined by Raza Weber, a PhD candidate and design researcher from Matters of Activity, sharing of her collaboration with UK-based company Kerosol and her current research into biochemistry. So for today, um, we are delighted to have you all here for a conversation all together. And we would love to hear your thoughts and questions and please feel welcome to share them in the chat at any time. Um, for practical reasons, we ask everyone joining us to keep their videos and also their microphones off, please, uh, during the whole event. 
um, but I will be in touch with you via the chat quest uh, chat function. So for now, uh, let's welcome Dr. Amanda Jarvis, who is the lead of the Jarvis Group at the University of Edinburgh, and her research interests revolve around the application of biological architecture to the design of transition metal catalysts to develop highly selective catalysts uh, for, whoops, oh, <laughs> um, one second, um, to develop highly selective catalysts for unnatural reactions such as C to H amination. But Amanda can explain much more about it. Um, and yeah, I'll just hand over to her and thank you, Amanda, and welcome. Thank you very much. Um, can everyone see my screen? Thank you, we can see your screen, Amanda. Um, okay, so thanks for the introduction and welcome to everyone um, that's come along. I'm really excited to see so many of you here uh, and interested in discussing um, kind of design and uh, chemistry and what it can mean. Um, so I thought I would just kind of say a little bit about where I come from in this in this journey. So I'm I'm a chemist that works in synthetic chemistry, um, and if we go all the way back to my PhD. Um, this is where kind of I first started with some design, um, and I was looking at rational ligand design for catalysis. So for the um, non chemists in the room, this might not make much sense, but we were interested in designing these a variety of phosphine ligands, and these are um, chemicals that bind to a metal and change how it acts and its properties. And the particular ligand I was interested in is shown here in a physical representation. And if we think about why it was designed, the blue and the red parts were designed as parts we could change, which we hoped would change the properties of this ligand. Um, and so I spent a lot of time playing around with this. Um, and in the process of this work, one of the ligands I designed was the phosphine sulfide shown here. And I've just brought this up to kind of highlight the more visual aspect of the chemical language and synthesis. Um, so here we are making different copper complexes. And this is one way that we commonly um, draw out these different complexes. And each of these three ones shown here represent a different metal complex. Um, and then we also have a representation shown here, which is an X-ray crystal structure of this top complex. So this Unfortunately, we could only grow on crystals. We never managed to make bulk material of this, um, but it showed this really interesting ladder structure that we're quite excited about and interested in. And then to go further, you know, when we kind of show our work or kind of develop papers, we often then take these images and kind of develop them further. And so this was a cover design we put together for this work, um, where again, we've got Kind of a version of the crystal structure as well as blackboards representing the chemistry. So this is just a little bit of where I started from um, going forward but then you know I'm not the only person that talks about design and rational design. Um, many other people have. Um, and uh, a few years later, so three years ago, I ended up doing art and science on a postcard um, which was a InterSci um, and ASCUS event, bringing together artists um, and scientists. And from that, kind of another aspect of my attention, which is whenever I talk to people that are not chemists, they often, fairly often say chemistry is hard as a starting point. Um, and this was the same when I was speaking with Honza Tanowski, who I did, was my partner in this. Um, I started off doing the classical route of trying to share um, the chemistry, what bonds I was making, and that sort of concept. But it was actually when I moved on to talking about the sustainability um, and the fact that I was designing um, a catalyst that would improve sustainability in chemical synthesis that we realized that we had an overlap. And that sort of made me start to think that maybe like concepts such as sustainability and also design could be a better starting point um, for a discussion. 
And just shown here is one of the outcomes from that art and science on a postcard, where this representation is a drawing of a clay model I made of our artificial metalloenzyme, which acts as a protein scaffold, which is brought to life by the inclusion of a metal that comes into it. Um, and that was the discussion we had earlier. So I mentioned there's many other different, um, other chemists have talked about design, and I just wanted to highlight a few papers that show this really nicely. Um, so this is a quote from the chemist and the architect, to imagine a structure and then express it in a material form is one of the most satisfying of human activities. It is pervasive throughout the arts and crafts, and it is one of the defining features of architecture. It is also at the heart of synthetic chemistry um, by Dirk Kilner. And this is just one of the images in that paper where you can see kind of how these molecules that we've represented also match on to kind of ideas of architecture, calcane, shirt chain, the kind of idea of a column. So I really I would suggest checking this out if you're interested in this field, um, as it's a really nice discussion of similarities between uh, chemistry and architecture. A slightly different approach um, is taken in this uh, by Paul Wender, um, where he talks about function through synthesis and form design. Um, and this was really kind of function, design for function and function driven design is what they feel they do. So starting from inspiration, maybe in nature, and then designing it through to something that looks not really like what you'd find in like nature, but does the same job. Um, and so the quote I found from this paper was form follows function, design unifies the two. Known or new function can also be created through knowledge driven design. Design provides a choice over form and thus whether a structure and its function will be synthetically accessible in the steps and time echoes of fashion. Chemists are uniquely positioned to drive design, utilizing knowledge of mechanism simply to create function and form in ways limited only by imagination. And this is really key. Um, so an example they had here is this is in a kind of a natural product with um, biological activity um, and uh, inhibitor. And then this is the, the target that they made, which is much simpler, but still contains the key groups that we need. And throughout this, there's other thoughts as well. So in this case, we're supposed to talk about design um, but, and how design function can differ, but there's also discovery. Um, and that's an interesting thing that maybe we could pick up on is the role of discovery versus design. Um, and that's something that maybe you can kind of, could be proposed to differentiate between chemistry and say biology and physics is this idea that chemists can make new material that's never been seen before rather than predominantly asking questions about um, understanding. So I just wanted to look at then kind of design principles and whether these map onto chemistry kind of in preparation for the discussion. So I've just got two different sort of design principles here by Vitruvius and Dieter Rams um, that I imagine will be familiar to some of you. And if we look at some of the design principles, for example, useful um, or innovative, um, and thorough, these kind of quite easily map onto what chemistry do, um, chemists do and the products we type to make. However, some of them are maybe a bit more hard to understand how they come from chemistry. So good design is honest. Where would that fit in? Well, we can think about it in things like open science and reproducibility. Good design is long lasting. What does that mean within the context of chemistry? Um, so I would suggest it will be used and built on for years to come. And then finally, um, I wanted to kind of briefly touch on the similarity of tools, as I think this is something that can really act as a gateway um, into discussions like the tools and the processes. So again, from the chemist and the architect, a number of images that really highlight the use of models in chemistry, as well as in architecture and computer aided design and 3D printing as tools that can be used to get through and to show what we're doing. Um, whereas over here, we also see the role of drawing. So chemists often draw in a lab book. We still um, do a lot of drawing and actually probably been one of the slower sciences to take up the electronic lab book, potentially because of the ability to draw. Um, but also drawing changes it. So here we see morphine, but just shown from different orientations. 
Um, so those different orientations can allow you to see different things. So that's kind of all I wanted to say um, and just kind of reiterate some kind of final thoughts and questions that I had going forward is, do chemists and designers mean the same when we talk about design? Um, and what can we learn about the different disciplines? And is there a role where we can learn to teach design better in chemistry? And that's all I had to say. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, that was really inspiring. Uh, we look forward to learn more of your work uh, later on in the discussion. Um, so for now, um, again, welcome everyone. Uh, more and more people have joined. That's really fantastic. Please share your questions in the chat at any time if you like. Um, so let me introduce um, Emily Candela. Uh, she is a historian of design and science, working across writing, sound and curating. She produces the Atomic Radio podcast and was awarded the uh, Design Writing Prize by the Design History Society um, a year ago. And she has published in several journals, including the Journal of Visual Culture and Historical Studies in the Natural Sciences. Um, she received her PhD in the history of design and history of science from RCA in the UK and the Science Museum. And she's, um, yeah, at the moment, a senior tutor at the School of Communication at the Royal College of Art, uh, where she leads the um, Master in Residence, uh, Master Research, sorry, program for Communication Design Pathway. And so thank you so much for joining today, Emily, and over to you. Thank you, Paula. And um, thank you so much to Paula, Amanda, and Askus for having me here today. <clears throat> And I apologize, I have a bit of a cold, <laughs> um, so my voice uh, might sound a little bit raspy. Um, I'm going to quickly um, introduce myself with um, a short presentation, um, just kind of following on from Paula's wonderful introduction. Okay, um, so I am a historian of science and design. Um, and a lot of my research <clears throat> focuses on, on one hand, visualizations, the way that um, scientists sort of design um, forms of communication um, about the knowledge that they create. Um, also processes, <clears throat> how designers and scientists work, how they interact, um, and instances in which they collaborate, um, which is one of my great interests and why I think I'm here today. Um, and also, um, I'm interested in the stories about these fields, so how they're remembered, how interactions between them are remembered as well. And much of my research has focused on relationships in the 20th century between design and the science of X-ray crystallography, um, which has applications in chemistry, as well as other fields. Um, it's sort of variously described as a science or a technique. Um, X-ray crystallography emerged in the early 20th century as a way to investigate crystal structures, the sort of structures of atoms and molecules, structures of mac macromolecules and crystals. Um, it is, for instance, behind the discovery of the DNA double helix. This diagram that I'm showing on the screen right now is of information about insulin. It's based on X-ray crystallography research. Um, by the British crystallographer Dorothy Hodgkin, um, produced in the mid 20th century. <clears throat> I'm really interested in how different practices and conventions from both design and science, styles of drawing and making and representing um, can not only represent knowledge, but in some cases also make knowledge differently. Um, so you may see that this um, image resembles the previous one that I showed. Um, so pictured here is a lace pattern made in 1951 um, by a collaboration between um, X-ray crystallography and design for the Festival of Britain um, based on that insulin diagram that I showed in the previous slide. Um, it's one of the things that I've been um, writing about recently. My work involves developing interdisciplinary methods for historians to think about both fields, science and design. But I also research and write about interdisciplinarity in terms of 
current practitioners and practitioners in the past of design and science and what it means for what are essentially, I think of as um, cross-cultural relationships and knowledge exchange across these boundaries. Um, so my research on the festival pattern group, the group that produced that lace pattern, is comes under the umbrella of um, my research, which I call mid-century molecular, looking at the relationships between x-ray crystallography and design um, in the 20th century. The festival pattern group was, was actually sparked um, by the x-ray crystallographer Helen McGaw, um, who was the first woman working in the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. Um, and she was also the sort of sole scientist working on this project that incorporated many different um, manufacturers and designers from lace to metal to um, window glass <clears throat> and culminated, like I said, in the 1951 Festival of Britain. Um, and I was in very interested in the dynamics of exchange between Helen McGaw, the scientist, and the um, industries and designers involved in the collaboration, um, particularly where their communication was wordless. So not only looking at things like meetings of their minutes, but at how, how they sort of passed back and forth images and diagrams. Um, and so some of my work on this is coming out in the book Design and Science, which comes out um, in January, edited by Leslie Atzman, um, which may be interest, of interest to people here because um, it brings together a number of scholars and um, designers who are working collaboratively with scientists. I'm also interested in how scientists work like designers sometimes, um, or in the past also like craftspeople in producing um, models and diagrams. Um, these are models made by crystallographers in Cambridge in the 1960s. And I'm really interested in this period because it's before computer modeling um, was available. So they're working with whatever they had available. Um, for a long time, they were also dealing with materials shortages as a result of World War II. And we're using things like clothes pegs and you can see table tennis balls in here and little bits of tubing to represent these really complex structures of things like viruses. <clears throat> and I've expanded on this through the podcast Atomic Radio that Paula mentioned um, that I made a few years ago that looked at relationships between X-ray crystallography design and also art. Um, and you can listen to that on iTunes or on our website, atomicradio.org. And then finally, I've recently brought my interest in scientific representations and visualizations and, um, and thinking from both angles of design and science to what has been known as the spiky blob, um, the image of the COVID-19 virus. Um, so I've been looking at how this particular medical illustration sort of serves as a modern form of wordless risk communication, a kind of emergency alert um, along the lines of a kind of history um, that includes poster design for things like um, I've pictured here, um, the Silence Equals Death project by the activist group ACT UP um, that was aimed to bring attention to AIDS in the 1980s. Um, and I'm interested in how the actually the medical illustration was also shaped by political debates in the US at the time that it was created and what it really meant to have this kind of bio, biomedical image as what became a kind of icon for the pandemic. Um, so that's kind of where I am now. Thank you everyone. Um, and I really look forward to speaking with everyone here today. Okay. Um, so now I'm very pleased to introduce um, Adam and John from Lancaster University. Um, so um, John Hardy is a senior lecturer in materials chemistry at Lancaster. John is an interdisciplinary researcher with experience in chemistry, materials science, pharmacy, and biomedical engineering. He develops materials that interact with electricity, light, and magnetism for a variety of technical applications, such as transient electronics, 
and medical applications. He's particularly interested in bioelectronics, um, which includes biodegradable conducting polymers, 3D printable conducting and 3D printable conducting polymers, and biophotonics for tissue engineering and neuromodulation. Adam Blaney is a lecturer in responsive architecture at Lancaster University. His research focuses on developing digital design and fabrication processes to create physically responsive, adaptive, and self-healing objects and architectural structures. Additionally, based on principles from these prototypes, Adam develops speculative visions of materially adaptive architecture and cities. So I'll pass it over to Adam and John now um, to present on their work. Thank you. Is that like sharing? Yeah. Is that sharing? Yes, yes, we can see it. Thanks, Adam. Grand. Yeah, um, thanks very much for having us. Uh, it's really interesting and great part, part of this topic and discussion. Um, so yeah, I suppose to just kick it off and introduce myself. Um, uh, yeah, Adam Blaney um, and the presentation's based on a pilot study funded by Connected Everything, in which Myth um, Design collaborated actively with Chemistry, who is John. Do you want to um, say anything on that, John? So as a chemist, what I enjoy about working with designers is that they bring completely different perspectives to research and also ask you to work at really different scales. So what I've tinkered in the past with engineering, that's tended to be for very small samples. And then when I talk to Adam, he's talking about kind of meters and uh, kind of much, much more significant quantities of materials than I would typically contemplate working with. And that's one of the things I really enjoy about working with Adam. Cool. Yeah, so it's been brilliant working with John because it's sort of that openness and the nature of um, willing to collaborate. It's not like felt like, and this is something I feel it's very strong in Lancaster, everyone I've had conversations with, um, it's open to collaboration and almost not shutting down initial ideas. It's sort of that explorative nature that's really great to enable all this stuff. Um, so to sort of give it some context from my background, um, the bigger vision is sort of, everything's based on these linear design and manufacturing processes, and that leads to significant material waste. And that's because an interesting thing that's cropped up is this um, chemists seem to, oh, they can synthesize materials and they have functional properties, whereas design is almost inherent a material world, like artists have a color palette. If you can design your own colors or materials, it opens up these new um, potentials. So by collaborating with John, we need to develop circular design and fabrication processes. And by developing materials that can respond and self-heal, it, it negates all these, um, this wasteful sort of nature. So this is where some sort of previous research brings it together is um, creating a discourse between material properties um, design parameters and fabrication mechanisms. And I think that was sort of the in that enabled um, myself and John to have like a common language between each other. Um, is there anything that you want to add in on that, John? So I think as someone who uh, makes polymers and makes molecules that you then use to feed into materials design, what is I think really interesting again about working with Adam is um, that he is much more interested in I, I, again, I focus mostly on small scale things that interact with electricity, light, and magnetism. And then there are significant challenges that come in when Adam says, oh, you know, it'd be really interesting to design something that would kind of respond over really big kind of um, length scales. And I think those sorts of length scales can sometimes provide challenges. And that's where early scale prototypes have been really useful just to play around with and work out if the ideas could be realized. Yep, that's great. So in terms of um, the pilot project to sort of roll it out and what we collab actively collaborated over, we created this prototype setup where we modulated heat and magnetism and we used these um, plastic-like materials that were magnetized. So we have a magnet array that we can change the position of magnets within like an 18 centimetre by 18 centimetre grid. So we get kind of it go, obviously going from molecular scale to something that's tangible and holdable and that sort of throws up kind of interesting design dynamics or in um, parameters that become time-based but also property-based and 
we're able to, by using multiple stimuli, we can iteratively update materials. So not to make that less wordy, is we can melt some materials down, we can change the sort of the textures, the, the sort of parameters and the colors and everything by using design interfaces. So there's a link between the design tool, the fabrication sort of process and the material properties. So in order to start working on this, chemistry generated a lot host of material samples and the criteria really was, can it melt? Is it sort of solid at room temperature and a bit rigid so it's got some functionality to do it? And then we just tested at a very small scale, like a two centimeter scale, which ones worked. Um, do you want to talk about the material samples and what that sort of entailed, John? Yeah, so while the early prototypes focused on using uh, waxes because they tend to melt at low temperatures and enable you then to kind of move them and transform them with relative ease in response to magnetic fields. We realized that although those are really appealing to look at, they are really tricky to handle because they tend to be quite mechanically brittle. And that's where we can use some chemistry, some not understanding of chemistry and um, the fact that molecular weights of molecules tend to have some sort of relationship with their mechanical properties and then find polymers where the melting points would be easily achievable so that then we could generate samples which were mechanically robust and easily handleable and unlikely to break or fracture and then um, generate samples which are then effectively first early prototypes of something which might be useful at a really large scale and again this was really this was a really interesting uh, problem, and where there is obviously some really useful overlap between design and, and some chemistry. Great. So from those host of material samples, we start to scale up, and this is sort of more clearly demonstrates how we're interacting with matter in a novel kind of way. So we had this sort of broken material that we can melt down so it demonstrates self-healing. And then as we manipulate the, the magnetic stimuli underneath, we can then start to generate different volumes of material in certain locations, um, different textures, different color gradients. And then that means we could also start bridging towards making those patterns functional if the demands fluctuate as well. So no longer in the sense of if your, demand, if your design becomes outdated or if it becomes damaged, it doesn't need to be thrown away anymore. We can put it back in our kind of this fabricator and we can update it again. And to sort of whiz on a little bit, um, sort of these implications that come out of it. So this is when it's re-solidified. We get these very high resolution material properties that we... There's this trade-off for working with these noisy systems where we're getting some material properties that are associated with our stimuli, such as surface textures, colors, transparencies, because they're, they're linked quite strongly with magnetism. Um, but it's not finely controlled, say, as some things that have came out of 3D printing. But instead of fixing form post-fabrication, we can go back in like this second iteration and move material around again. It's What's interesting though is when we start to scale up, there's quite interesting design implications that come with this, certainly say like legacy of material interactions that sort of persist after that as well. And so this is the legacy where previous iterations um, sort of remained within it. So there's need to reset materials as well. And um, what that means in terms of does it limit or future interactions or does it mean that you can trace back previous interactions to tune them further as well. In terms of a second material sample, so this is comparatively a lot stronger. Um, sorry if I'm whizzing through this. Um, this was comparatively a lot stronger, but it also then throws up more prominent material properties as well. So this sample generated stronger surface textures at a certain window of time and those diminish over time as well. So not only does it mean a certain material um, palette is more suitable for an application, there's windows to interact with materials as well that means you can elicit properties as well. So something that we're just sort of working on to make it more functional is developing a tangible user interface where we can use sensor data to upload that or push that remotely into materials as well. So no longer will the sort of 
the patterns be based on arbitrary sort of interfaces. We could sort of put these within an application. We could monitor live data, we could record average data and then put them back into materials for a given application and make them more bespoke to humans interactions over time as sort of demands fluctuate for um, things like that. Um, so just to summarize, in terms of material interactions and implications, like you said, the, it's no longer this kind of super accuracy at this point is sort of reliability issues with it. There's noise within the system, but that gives these other potentials where you can get circularity. There's material legacy within that. There's time lags as well. So it sort of, at this point, this approach lends itself to not in situ um, responses. So it, it kind of tailors what applications that for. And again, windows to elicit material properties response. So it's time-based interactions as well. Is there anything that you wanna highlight that you've sort of deduced from the material implications, John? Um, the, while these might, initially just look visually appealing visually interesting but they do also have um quite a lot of other applications other than just that so we are beginning to pursue um an application for funding with medics because we can easily foresee some opportunity to make reconfigurable materials for medic applications um and there are kind of things which i think have fallen out of the design process where ideas have been sparked and a kind of slightly entrepreneurial uh, mindset means that we can take these in some really new directions. Brilliant. And then a final sort of point, which is some interesting things that have already cropped up, is the sort of the nature of collaboration between um, design and chemistry. So it was this near the um, this open mindset of there is noise within these systems, and it's not this finite tolerance, which is really interesting that. Um, from Anders' talk that you are designing specific molecules and they have determined behaviors that are desirable, but they potentially become a lot more noisy as you scale up kind of thing. And there's there's a different sort of mindset with that. Implications of scale, yeah. So as you scale up, um, there it, it becomes noisier, these material palettes. So as a designer, I'm no longer inherent to material, like my background in architecture. To give a really boring example, I'm not just going to build a building out of bricks that someone's given me the bricks. I'm going to go design the bricks and that can change over the whole length of the building or the city. And then potentially that could interact or integrate with other material systems as well. So I think it begins to open up ecologies within um, design as well. And something that um, really sort of struck me as a learning um, from working with John was analogies were really helpful as to sort of understand how the materials are behaving as well. So the why materials diminish effects over a, a period of time is because the polymers act like a fishing net and the magnetic magnetic particles would bring those polymers together and that would make them bunch up. And then as they kind of the fishing net relaxes, it lets things disappear. And that was why that's understanding the mechanisms of it all. So once you understand the mechanisms through an analogy, you can kind of tune or understand how you can interact with it further. So you can design your systems around that. So those are my kind of key find or takes and reflections from um, a six month project with John, which was fantastic working with him as well. Do you want to uh, jump in with anything, John, <laughs> of how bad it was working with me, how flaky it was? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was really interesting. I think working with people with different backgrounds always raises opportunities. It challenges the way you think. It makes you stop and ask why you work in a specific uh, specific way. And um, I think that those sorts of weird interactions can often lead you to this kind of one plus one equals four situation where new things will spark purely because you've had a weird conversation. So I think it was definitely really interesting. There's obviously going to be challenges along communication where occasionally Adam needs to come in and kick my ass because I'm behind schedule for something. Uh, and that's just because our timelines for work plans tend to be quite a bit different. But otherwise, it's, I think it's a really, really interesting and fun experience. And I would wholeheartedly recommend it to anyone. If, they, if you find someone who you kind of get along with, but it's definitely a good experience to, to, to play with. That's brilliant. Um, am I okay to stop sharing? Yeah, that's fine, Adam. 
Okay. Sorry if I overran. No, actually, you're um, you're both um, perfectly timed. Um, thank you so much, Adam and John. It's really um, interesting to hear about your work. It sounds like a really fruitful collaboration, um, and also about your reflections on the collaboration itself. Um, I love this idea of new ideas coming out of weird conversations, <laughs> when your um, I suppose your own way of thinking about what you do kind of comes up against another field's. Um, Oh, sorry, stop sharing. I'm a complete newbie to Zoom, so am I stopped sharing now? Yes. yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Adam and John. Um, so I am now pleased to introduce Raza Weber. Um, she's a designer exploring the narrative and choreographic potential of materials and processes. Her design concepts are driven by a strong narrative approach and critical ecological thinking. She regularly teaches at international universities and is currently a research associate at ZHDK and pre-doctoral researcher at Matters of Activity Cluster of Excellence. She works across the disciplines of material research, architecture, product design, and film. In her practice-based PhD, Growing Matter, she investigates new material processes of built habitats within more than human marine environments as a way to both practice and question architecture today. Um, so we're very pleased to have you with us, Raza, and um, I'll let you share your screen now to begin your presentation. Thank you, Emily, for this nice introduction. And it saves me a little bit of time because then I don't have to say anything about myself. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Yes. Wonderful. So as Emily already mentioned, uh, I'm a designer. Thank you. We can see your screen, Martha. Wonderful. <clears throat> I'm a designer and researcher associated to the University of the Arts in Zurich, um, uh, based in Berlin. And as you can see, I'm also a diver. That's not only random information, but will make sense in a few minutes. But let's dive right into the topic. So for me, the collaboration with um, other sciences is actually essential to the understanding of resources and where these resources come from. As Dirk Hebel, uh, a German author once said, we are potentially facing a fourth biologically driven industrial revolution, and I may add a chemically driven one. Um, as designers, we are currently working on the smallest entities of life. So we are working on tissue, creating tissues, on growing coral reefs, on growing stone, on growing mycelium. And uh, these new explorations actually do make sense as we are facing uh, raw material scarcity. And I do believe that the um, gas crisis that we are facing at the moment is only the preludium to something that will cascade uh, in the coming decades. And this is why I, as a designer, I'm interested in uh, the question how we can move on from mining material resources to growing them. And this also has to do with what I call biochemical explorations, especially in marine environments, but also in earlier collaborations uh, with chemistry. And uh, as I was asked uh, by Askus to um, introduce my work a little bit, also my earlier works, um, I'm quickly gonna uh, show you one project and then uh, proceed uh, with my current PhD research. So as a designer, I'm mainly interested not in classical product design, but uh, in the intersection of um, these material processes, how materials come to life, where they come from, and actually also where they go to. And that brought me um, to my current research topic. Um, since 2013, I'm collaborating with a textile designer under the studio name Blonde and Bieber. Uh, her name is Esti Glomb, and together we have uh, developed a number of different natural pigments, um, especially pigments from microalgae, which I'm not going to talk about today, but what I would like to highlight is the collaboration with a UK-based um, chemistry company. Um, this, this color lab that we're working in is actually essential in multiple ways because it's really not only an aesthetic research that we're doing, but also a question of how we can apply um, chemistry to um, the world of um, product design or, or textile design. The reason why this is essential um, to current uh, production cycles is quite obvious. Um, I always like to show this image because it's quite recent. It's taken two years ago by Greenpeace. 
um, and it shows a river at the, in the Philippines that is closely linked to the textile industry. Uh, and the common quote is, if you want to know what color is trend in the season, take a look at the river. So we still have the problem of uh, a lot of highly toxic um, chemicals um, that are contaminating our environments. And the question is, how can we reduce um, these toxins? Um, that's a reason for looking into alternative uh, technologies for producing textiles. As designers, of course, we do this in a more playful way. So we try to catalog our work and structure it in, in terms of um, small lab books where we um, know the different experiments that we uh, undergo, um, the ways that we use the pigments, the underlying materials that we treat, um, the different forms of silk, leather, cotton that we apply in order to gain and, and uh, develop our knowledge and also get back to it, can't be able to look into these catalogs. And in 2015, we were approached by Carasol, which is a UK-based um, chemistry company, a spin-off of um, the University of Leeds, that is uh, particularly researching into natural um, uh, products um, in terms of um, beauty products or um, other forms of application. So at that time, they had developed um, a new pigment that derives from the um, black currant berry. So it's a waste product from the food industries, from juice production. And the peel of this black, black currant berry is actually a very potent and interesting um, pigment to work with. And they realized that treating this pigment with different pH levels produces very different colors. Their main problem was how to apply this and how to make sense of this find and to bring it to the market. So this collaboration between Richard Blackburn, um, head of uh, Carousel, and us as designers was actually starting from, I would say, a finished product idea, but that needed some um, hint for applications. And I'm highlighting this because I think it's essential to understand where the collaboration takes place. Does it take place earlier in the development? Of the, um, of the applications and of the product, but or does do we as designers come in later? And typically a classical understanding is that we bring design in quite late to make things beautiful and nice <laughs> or applicable. Um, but I do think that currently there's a shift happening um, in the science world to bring in designers into the process of development already into the molecular thinking, so to speak. So their problem was that they had an idea of applying these colors, but their main application field at that time was hair dyes, which was perhaps not the biggest market. So for us, it was interesting to understand what other forms of applications could be found. So we started testing um, textile dyes from the natural pigments uh, with different pH treatments. We did wash fastness and light, light fastness tests uh, with these uh, first uh, pigment um, attempts. And later on, translated this into a collection. We were um, invited by the Goethe Institute, a German research institute uh, in Los Angeles, to design a sustainable uh, fashion collection. We did that collaboratively with a number of Berlin-based designers, such as David Tomaszewski, Schmidt Takahashi. These are names in the uh, German fashion world. I'm not sure if uh, the international audience is familiar to them, but they are the bigger ones in, in the German realm. But our main goal was not to think about the cuts um, uh, of, of these garments, but actually to reinvent the colors um, that were applied to them. So we were actually um, only dyeing with natural pigments. And it was also essential for us to make people understand how potent these pigments are. So we dyed um, these um, shoes live on stage in order to make people grasp um, the strong intensity of the colors. So during the performance, these shoes were actually dyed and later on they came out in this strong red color. Um, and uh, this fashion collection was um, and had the idea ingrained to really use all the parts of the pigment um, and to not leave any waste in the production, also not in terms of the cutoffs of the garments. So as you can see, um, the pigment um, as a natural product um, uh, is um, purple, but actually if you treat it, you can um, tweak it to green, blue, uh, yellow, gold, according to the pH level that you apply to the dyes. Um, later on, Carousel was um, continuing with these, the development of these products 
especially in cosmetics. Um, so we also started collaborating on thinking about potential concepts for uh, making this um, accessible. But I would like to close this first section or the insight into this first pro product uh, project um, with a question that I inherently had for the last years. Um, what I'm showing here is um, an image of an algae farm, a microalgae farm um, in, the, in the middle of a desert in the US that was built as a monoculture. And the question that came up for me was the following. We as designers interested in sustainability are led to the thinking that um, natural material, bio materials, as we call them, uh, is the better choice for creating sustainable futures. The result most often is that we still end up in monoculture production because we are still mining a natural uh, resource. We are still producing it in a bigger quantity. So in the end, nothing, um, there is no single solution. There's no single solution for using black currant peel um, for exclusively doing cosmetics. There's no single solution to apply microalgae in the process of um, production. I do believe that there needs to be a shift um, of understanding how we as designers collaborate with other forms of life. And that brought me to the essential questions that I'm dealing with right now uh, in my own research. Uh, my leading question or guiding question was how can we grow resources instead of mining them? And that brought me to the underwater environment, which seems surprising, but actually for me made a lot of sense. And my project, my current PhD research, uh, Growing Matter, I'm researching on the artificial growth of limestone underwater uh, by means of biochemical electrolysis. And um, I want to understand how we as designers can create architectures that are inhabitable for humans, but also for other forms of life. So how can we grow structures collaboratively with other living beings and how is design actually maneuvered not only by us humans, but by these other entities of life, so to speak. Um, while researching on this topic, um, I came across an extremely exciting research paper, or a number of papers from the 1970s by um, an, ar an architect, which is called Wolf Hilberts, who worked in the US, and a biochemist, Thomas Burrow, who's still alive, based in the US. They both developed the um, principle of um, bio rock, and bio rock is actually a form of growing limestone underwater by electrolysis. So you're actually able to have a human-made stone underwater. And um, that sparked this idea for me to actually develop this um, technology further and made me extremely interested in the, in the results or potential of these uh, collaborations. I'm sorry, my screen is stuck right now. I hope it recovers. Uh oh not good. Let me stop sharing and go back to it, perhaps. Can you still hear me? Yes, we could hear you, Raza. <clears throat> Take your time. Yes. Yeah, I'm trying, but this could be interesting because it's actually not reacting at all. I can hear you, but my entire screen is stuck. Ah, now it's coming back. I do um, also have your presentation if you'd like me to share it. Yeah, it's fine. I think I will give it another shot. <laughs> I like to be in control of things, otherwise I get nervous. <laughs> I understand. Uh, so, wait a second. Um, we share. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. It's pretty slow, so I'm a bit worried that this might not recover well. So, to explain the process very briefly, um, the Byrock principle is quite simple. It's uh, for for the chemists in the room. It's maybe even boring. <laughs> I don't know. So you, it's a process of electrolysis where you put in a plus and a minus pole as an anode and cathode. Um, the cathode has the ability to uh, attract uh, minerals and naturally dissolved minerals in seawater and um, around the anode and cathode in, in a ionic field, uh, field is building up. So after a while, you would have um, minerals, uh, aragonite and bronzeite um, accreting on the structure, on the steel structure, which is conducted. 
And this uh, limestone uh, layer is actually quite invitive uh, for other forms of life. So usually you would have biofilms. This is where biology comes in. Biofilms building up on the surface and later on corals or other forms of life that like to grow on these structures. And um, the structure uh, grows impressively fast. So these samples here on the left um, are historic samples from wild field birds. They took about two years to grow. Um, and today the BIREC patent, which was, um, which was um, in power, I don't know how to say that, until 2019 has expired. So you can actually use it freely. And for me, it was interesting to understand how to design in with and by this ocean that I'm surrounded by, uh, with uh, if I'm diving. Um, what was quite interesting for me uh, is a, um, an article by Cruz and Beckett, um, who are researching at the RCA in London, who speak about bioreceptivity in architecture. So they speak about surfaces that are not merely, um, that not, do not need to be sealed or treated, but that can actually be bioreceptive to other forms of life. So that are invited to other species. And we know this term also from uh, the nautic language. So biofouling is a common term that you encounter if you look into the building of ships. Um, biofouling uh, is nothing more than bioreceptivity for me. So um, to invite other forms of life to grow on the structure. Um, why is this relevant? Of course, it's relevant because we are facing an anthropogenic crisis and this crisis also affects the ocean. This is, for example, um, a former construction site of a mega pier where I was diving. And for me, it's the perfect illustration of what I would call an anthropo-ocean, uh, an anthropogenically uh, changed environment, uh, which is not able to um, recover by itself in a short amount of time. So we as designers could actually think about how to make fruitful collaborations between these other forms of life and our own mating. I'm not the only one who researches into this topic. Um, I, my research project is connected to REEFs, um, research project between a microbiologist and designer in Zurich, um, who are building um, blocks for coral reef restoration. I'm in close contact to Thomas Barrow, who's one of the inventors of the technology. And I've recently came back. Um, that's why I'm a bit tent <laughs> flying back from a one month uh, research stay on Corsica at the biological field station where I was diving together with the Max Planck Institute. And I'm in, especially interested in the work of Anja Wegner, who researches on something that she calls fish architecture from a biological point of view. So we as biology and design are trying to establish a conversation also about the methods that could be applied to this, uh, apply to these underwater environments. Um, to make a last small detour, um, designing for me has a lot to do with evolutionary theory and the question how we can get to terms um, with symbiotic forms of living. Um, this refers back to the great and fantastic work of Lynn Margulis and her um, predecessors as Mereshkovsky and Kozhopoliansky, who spoke about um, the evolution, um, not as a linear family tree, but actually as a form of transmutation and collaboration of different species. And I think if we take this term seriously and really understand what symbiosis in terms of a fruitful collaboration mean, we end up with very interesting new questions for design. And the questions that I'm currently asking myself is how could symbiogenesis be activated for design? How does it affect the role of the author? So us as designers, as the genius of making, uh, what agency does this term give to other forms of life and the creation process? And the question which I like the most, how structured or chaotic will the result be? Because we are out of control. Going coming back to the control. So I would like to switch from autopoiesis and system thinking to a form of sympoiesis. Uh, and I suggest to call this term symbiodesign, a term that I'm currently researching on how to establish this in a grander scale together with other disciplines, also from natural sciences and humanities. So um, to look back into my current project, um, I do have some structures underwater that are growing by themselves now. So I did the initial, I, I gave the initial spark, but now they're growing by themselves and I'm observing how these structures form and create life and also change, perhaps also fail underwater. Um, 
a number of designers do the same as the Symbiotic Space Collective and the other two researchers that I already mentioned. So um, my prototyping methods include a lot of um, different life worlds from crafts, human making to technologies that I'm implying um, as the low voltage electricity that I have to apply to the system, um, the environments that I'm working with, but also um, the other forms of life underneath sea level that enact um, with the structures of my own making. And that's what I'm curious about to research also um, for the coming um, two or three years of my PhD thesis. Um, I'm flipping to this because I see uh, in regard to the time that we are running out of time. So I would like to close um, with an image of uh, my underwater prototype and my own realization of the last dive that when you go underwater, you're closely connected to an underwater environment. It's the technologies that you apply, it's the animals and the environment that you have to engage with. So as uh, Vernatsky once said, our lives are connected through all these animated waters. And with that, I would like to give it back to you and be happy about any further questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raza. That's really fascinating. Um, I like how you took the idea of collaboration to another level of thinking about collaboration with nature. And I think I wrote down something you said, which was that you were designing with the ocean, um, which I think is a really great kind of um, thought provoking point. Um, so we're going to move on now to a discussion with our um, fantastic panelists. Um, so if you wouldn't mind putting your videos on.